my name is Andres Jaque, and I'm the dean at Columbia GSAP. Uh, and for me, it's, it's so unique, this moment. Uh, it's a, a moment that we can celebrate and discuss and know more about the work of Mark, Mark Suramaki. Uh, and uh, Mark has been teaching here since 2004, and it's inseparable. The history of GSAP is inseparable, inseparable from the work that Mark has been doing in the, the last decades. And I think that when we go back, when we look back to what is the evolution of design and the way it's understood, not only here, but also in Princeton, uh, in MIT, in, in the GSD, uh, it could not be explained without the work that Mark Suramaki has been uh, doing uh, in the last decades. Uh, I have the feeling that we very well know uh, what the section of a building can do through the work of Mark together with uh, his partners uh, and as, at LTL. Uh, architects and I think the manual of the section uh, allowed and was a, a milestone in understanding that architecture operates on the social as the social uh, and that the materiality of architecture was a, a site where politics would be enacted or through as uh, politics would be enacted and that's something that Mark contributed to represent to, to provide documents that could fix that information and in a comparative way to produce a huge uh, repertoire, I would say, or, or a compendium of, of knowledge on that through the revision of, of the, the most known, the, well, the, the, the most important cases of architectural design that had circulated in architectural media. Very recently last year, there was a new addition to this. I mean, that, that was not the first book that Mark did. Uh, but but was uh, actually the one that in, in, was inevitably making all of us go through, through his work and their work. And last year, the manual of bio, biogenic house sections was following the same success and in equal impact in the field of architecture. I must say that the capacity to bring architectural design to a discussion where the societal and the ecological was uh, basically the purpose or, or the main uh, uh, effect uh, on which architecture could be measured and could be understood is something that was very uniquely done at a large scale in the work that, that Mark, together with his partners, did. But that's not the only thing that Mark has done, and actually that came uh, in parallel and uh, I would say totally uh, in connection with the work that, that you've been doing, both in your practice, uh, with relevant buildings that, I, for me, for instance, the, the Children's Enrichment Center in Arkansas, it's an amazing project that was developed in collaboration also with Escape, right? And that was uh, making it possible to imagine an architecture that could change in relationship with, with plants, with the land, with the earth. Uh, and that was actually something that I would say created a milestone that could unavoidably open a discussion that could not be avoided by anyone else that could basically would have to refer to, to a building like this. Uh, here, right here in the Pulitzer Center, it's the Institute for Media Innovation that I encourage everyone to visit. That was actually, uh, the, the amount of awards that it accumulated is, is actually a little bit uh, offensive, I would say. And, but still people love Mark and, and colleagues love uh, the work, so that means a lot, that, that says a lot. And the Epson Hall in Cornell University is also something that we all remember and something that, that, that makes people go to Cornell instead of staying here in Columbia as, uh, for visiting only, of course. Uh, uh, so that, that says a lot because we, we feel so comfortable here that we never want to go to other places. So, but that's something that I want to underline, the capacity of each of these buildings to establish an, uh, what I would say a milestone that makes uh, things that are discussed, experimented, a new standard that is then applied by everyone. And I think that capacity to normalize innovation and to make it a new standard that everyone goes uh, through in the context of New York, in the context of, of the East Coast, in the context of uh, the US architecture, in the context of architecture at large, I think it's something that your firm has been doing for many years now and we, 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 we have to celebrate now. That, of course, has not escaped anyone's attention. And just to mention one important achievement, they, in 2007, uh, uh, Mark, together with his partners, uh, got the National Design Award from the Cooper Hewitt Museum, which, as you know, it's a it's a huge uh, thing in the US. It's basically the most important rec national recognition to, that, archi that any architect can get. And, and uh, it was very much 
It was not only that it was very celebrated, but it was very much agreed by everyone at the time that that happened. And just to mention a few, a couple of more things, I think that what we have to, what the first time I, I, I basically talked to students here, I remember the, one of the first days at GSAB, I asked some students, what is the class that you would recommend me to pay attention to? And they all said, Marshall Mackey, you have to go to that class, it's amazing, it's really doing things, it's opening a discussion about how design is in, uh, happening in, relation to, in relationship with the social and with the ecological that you, you cannot miss. I want to say that also Mark is a very important person in the context of New York. Uh, and Mark is the president of the storefront uh, of architecture and the arts and, and arts. And, and I think this is something that speaks of Mark also dedication to nurture a collective uh, environment around architecture and nurture the profession as a space where uh, discussions, fun, uh, uh, connections with, with art and with, with, with culture uh, can be celebrated and highlighted. And I think this is very unique in a, in a, in a context that is incredibly competitive, that everyone's trying to maximize their capacity to the business, that uh, a firm like and a person like Mark dedicates efforts to better the context in which we operate and to understand how the profession is also space for, for uh, uh, relevant discussions and connections with other fields that are normally seen as not necessarily connected to business, I think are, is, is something that we have to celebrate. All this is to say how important it is at this point to discuss your work, Mark, to celebrate it, to understand in detail how the technical dimension that you've been uh, dedicating time to, it's connected to discussions about what are the, the social relationships that we want to promote, what are the ecological uh, constructions that we're, we, we can enact through architecture and in collaboration with other uh, uh, entities, I think is crucial. And for us to have this opportunity as a school also to reflect on how the work that you do here is connected to what you do both through your practice and through your writing and through your citizenship, uh, let's say, activism is so important. So uh, please join me in uh, welcoming Marshall Abaki here to speak in his home, Gisab. So wow, that was a lot. Uh, thank you, Andres, for that amazing introduction. Um, very generous and uh, for inviting me here tonight to speak um, at the Open House. So uh, as Andres alluded to, I'm gonna be speaking tonight about um, uh, the work of my uh, practice, LTL Architects, um, and um, uh, the work I do uh, with my partners, uh, Paul and David Lewis, as well as our kind of amazing group of collaborators um, at LTL. Um, that work involves not only um, the more expected client-driven commission built work, uh, but it also involves uh, self-generated speculative design propositions, as well as research-based publications. Um, uh, and again, uh, uh, Dean Hockey was alluding to uh, a couple of these uh, publications. These frequently take the form of what we've come to call manuals. Uh, we like this notion of the manual because it alludes to an idea of clarity and utility, and we really like the idea that these are useful documents that can actually be put out into the world and actually serve um, uh, as um, uh, guides and references um, and touch points for a broader discourse to develop. Um, oops, sorry, I clearly am not master of this yet. Um, so uh, the first of these um, publications was Manual of Section from 2016. Um, the book arose out of our own kind of obsession and fascination with section, both as a representational modality that allowed for the simultaneous apprehension of form, performance, material and tectonic conditions, uh, and embodied uh, kind of social uh, and spatial uh, perception uh, within any given structure, and also section as a kind of site of resistance uh, and invention uh, for architects throughout the 20th and 21st centuries uh, in the face of the kind of ruthless, efficiency of, uh, ruthless efficiencies of industrialized construction methodologies. Uh, the book's been kind of widely disseminated, reprinted, um, translated into five or six languages. We think there's a Turkish edition. Um, we're told there is. If anyone's seen it, um, we'd love to see that as well. Um, but we also um, have been grappling over the course of the, uh, the, the years, uh, intervening years since, like all of you, um, with um, the increasing existential urgency 
uh, of climate change, with the legacies of extractivism and the, natural, uh, the material exploitation of landscapes, and the devastating impacts of these systems on humans, on non-humans, uh, and on the planet at large. So we actually think that um, uh, this publication, Manual of Biogenic House Sections, which we released last year, uh, really this year, actually earlier this year, uh, is in many ways the more uh, important um, uh, uh, document. And it aligns with a moment within our own practice in which we're kind of shifting um, our attention to these questions of embodied carbon, uh, to questions of why we build, how we build, and most specifically, what we build with. Um, and the notion here is to sort of fundamentally rethink the material basis of our, of our architectures uh, in the light of uh, the crisis of climate, uh, in a sense, imagining a new paradigm for architecture and the Anthropocene. Uh, so the, the, the book is arranged according to nine material-based chapters and a chapter on reuse. Um, so I'm going to start, in a sense, from the end and talk a little bit about reuse, which has been a uh, kind of critical component of our practice over the years uh, and kind of undergirds a lot of the work that we do. Reuse is uh, a really vital way to address these questions of embodied carbon. We all know this kind of cliche that the, the most sustainable building is the building that already exists. Um, but moreover, we really feel that um, reuse uh, thinking reuse really allows for a kind of a shifting in the perception of how we approach an architectural project, right? Recognizing that buildings aren't permanent, uh, but they're continually in flux, they're shedding parts of themselves, they're acquiring new layers and new capacities, decaying and being repaired continuously. Uh, so thinking reuse really shifts the logic of the architectural project from questions of duration to questions of transformation, um, and the kind of design work kind of builds upon this continuously kind of emergent quality um, of, uh, uh, of the project at hand. Um, so the first of these I'm going to talk about is Steeplechase Pier in Coney Island. Um, this was a project that in many ways came in the wake of a project that we had conducted in 2010 as part of the exhibition Rising Currents at the Museum of Modern Art curated by Barry Bergdahl. As many of you may know, this was one of the first projects to look at the implications of sea level rise and climate change on cities. Uh, and about two years, almost exactly to the day after the closing of that show, Sandy hit um, uh, New York City. Uh, this is Steeplechase Pier during Sandy. This is Steeplechase Pier after, uh, in which basically the surface of the pier was unmoored from its kind of structural underpinnings. Uh, we were the architects for the renovation of the pier, and we worked obviously in close collaboration with engineers to develop a more resilient structure system that would uh, resist um, uh, kind of future storm events by actually not resisting them and allowing certain portions of the structure to be actually carried away more readily in a storm. Um, and this project, on one hand, is still the longest project, certainly, that we've ever done in the, in the office. It's about 1,000 feet long. But on the other hand, uh, actually, the work that we did here was uh, very much about reinforcing the idea of the pier as um, a social space, as a space of collectivity, of kind of mutual engagement. Uh, and uh, our actual design interventions involved very small scale, almost kind of urban furniture elements that actually repurposed uh, the wood from the demolished pier into a series of elements, uh, these sort of double-sided benches that would allow for simultaneous like ocean uh, gazing and people watching, a collective lounge that would allow for uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, kind of collective sunbathing. Uh, a canopy that, um, through its uh, articulated shading, would inscribe the name of Coney Island uh, in shadow onto the surface of the pier, um, and an elevated or inclined ramp at the terminus of the pier that allowed for the negotiation between the fishermen, who actually are the primary constituents, they kind of heavily use the end of, of the pier, and strollers uh, kind of moving out towards uh, views of the, uh, the eastern horizon and the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so here the idea was to really sort of think about um, these maybe micro scale ways within a very kind of macro scale kind of infrastructural um, element to kind of create a higher degree of, uh, of, of social engagement among the various kind of constituents who use the pier. Uh, the second project that I'm going to be talking about actually um, uh, operates more at a building scale. Uh, and this is a project that we did for uh, an arts organization uh, called uh, The Contemporary uh, in Austin, Texas. Uh, the the um, project was interesting because we actually got to renovate it twice. So this is a kind of a, a, a perfect example of a building that evolves over time, in this case relative to shifting organizational and institutional needs. Uh, the original uh, organization uh, melded with another um, uh, uh, entity within the city and therefore that how they needed to exhibit and display art changed. Uh, and we really kind of approached the project as this accumulation of histories, right? So we began by looking at 
Um, the origins of the building at the turn of the century as a proscenium theater, its transformation in the 1950s into a department store, actually that involved the kind of layering of structural systems and material conditions. And then we conceived of our additions and interventions as a series of strategic insertions that would not overwrite that existing architecture, but actually uh, augmented in very precise ways, allowing for new functionalities to emerge uh, without, in a way, canceling out the kind of rich properties of the uh, extant building. So this involved a number of different strategies. One was to um, look at this very long south-facing wall and introduce a series of glass masonry units that could be inserted without structural augmentation to allow for uh, uh, daylight to permeate the interior, uh, modifying the, this existing second story window as a double-sided projection screen that would actually allow for the transmission of uh, uh, content within the museum to project it out onto the sidewalk. Uh, and then this uh, kind of transformation of the existing 1950s awning as a kind of entry point um, into a public lobby space uh, that was then animated by a new timber stair that connected um, the kind of public uh, territory of the sidewalk up to a second level gallery. Uh, the stair uh, was composed out of these 32-foot-long uh, kind of timber elements uh, that uh, uh, kind of uh, um, uh, wedged open, both in plan and section, uh, reaching up to a second-story si skylight and allowing access to these newly re renovated galleries. In the gallery spaces, we had to augment the existing wood and steel trusses to support a new occupiable roof deck, and that allowed actually for the integration within those green uh, 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 I-beams for a series of wheel tracks that allowed us to have a, uh, a large 60-foot-long wall which could actually track throughout the gallery to create different exhibition contexts. The same time that structure supports a new uh, public event space at the roof deck and a canopy, a shade canopy that was actually part of the second story, uh, second stage of the renovation that can be um, modified through uh, urban scale curtains and this can become a kind of uh, collective gathering space for events um, and um, uh, sort of the activities of the gallery to, and the uh, organization to occupy a roof deck overlooking the city. It also becomes a kind of a framing device for uh, an artwork, a large-scale installation by the artist Robert Hodges called With Liberty and Justice for All. Uh, and we love the way that the building acts as a kind of a backdrop for political activity, for gathering uh, uh, along this very sort of active stretch of Congress Avenue in Austin, Texas that actually leads a few blocks away uh, to the state capitol building. So the third of these projects, and this is kind of a preamble, so I'm going through these relatively quickly, um, operates at the scale of an urban interior. This is a very recent project called Poster House. It's the first museum in the United States dedicated to uh, poster arts. Uh, and this is the space on 23rd Street here in Manhattan um, that um, we began with. Uh, the space was really interesting in that it was this very unusual ki condition of a through block, block site. So it connected from uh, 23rd Street on the south to 24th Street on the north uh, and created this kind of condition of a public thoroughfare. And we liked very much this idea of uh, the space of the museum as a space of passage, of kind of public procession. Um, and we were thinking about this idea of the poster as a public document, that in fact the natural kind of environment for the poster, its natural habitat, if you will, is really the street, the sidewalk. Uh, so how could we maintain that? We knew at the same time that we actually had to integrate a museum uh, quality uh, climate controlled gallery for works on paper into this same space, uh, which meant a high degree of uh, humidity and kind of temperature control um, that had to be kind of certifiable for borrowing of exhibitions and kind of delicate uh, artworks in the future. So what we did was to essentially split the space down the middle along an existing line of columns between a more enclosed climate controlled gallery space and then this open public passageway. We inflected the diagonal line of division between these spaces along an angle uh, to increase the dimension of the lobby along 23rd Street and the capacity of the gallery closer to 24th. A series of secondary modifications to articulate um, entrances to the gallery. Um, and then maintaining this idea of one side of the project is really an open public passage uh, where a visitor could move through from one side to the other, encountering a series of collective uh, programs uh, which were articulated through a continuous uh, kind of cabinetry element. So an, upon entry, uh, you're greeted by this 20-foot-long uh, cantilevered timber table that's linked to the structural steel of the original uh, 
architecture. Um, and then this division, right, which we almost thought of as the architectural equivalent of a split screen between a newly inserted architecture, this kind of uh, new gallery space that's rendered in a clay-based plaster. And then on the other side, really kind of as little modification as possible, but revealing um, and preserving and restoring the barrel vaults, the cast iron columns, uh, the party wall and the wood floor um, with kind of minimal intervention. So this was both a kind of spatial strategy, but also an economic one. Um, so we really only had to kind of intensively renovate one side of the space, creating this, again, uh, museum quality uh, gallery with the, all of the requisite levels of uh, environmental control on the one side, and then this more open public passage along which kind of the collective events of the museum were articulated through uh, essentially a 200 foot long uh, millwork item that modulated and um, uh, shifted uh, to incorporate programs, uh, bookstore, uh, reception desk, um, uh, entry lounge, cafe, et cetera, along the length of the space. Um, we wanted to highlight, even in the context of the new architecture, the existing um, uh, uh, historic architecture, so kind of illuminating these columns as they carve uh, into the uh, kind of new uh, canopy that extends from the gallery, and then at the kind of terminus of the gallery volume, this kind of uh, interactive photo booth that's correlated to the scale of the window on the street, connecting the space of the museum back onto the public space of the sidewalk. So uh, a lot of these projects, and this is another uh, renovation project that uh, Dean Hockey alluded to at Cornell University, um, although they were clearly involved in the uh, recuperation of the embodied carbon that was represented by the existing architecture, were really um, focused in many ways on kind of operational uh, energy, on like thinking about, um, let's say, more highly performing skins that in this case would create greater insulated benefits while diffusing daylight into a series of laboratories. Um, and since then, we've really been, uh, again, kind of uh, uh, addressing this question of how we can begin to shift into questions of uh, embodied carbon. Um, and I'm going to go through this. This is probably familiar territory for some of you, um, but it's maybe worth um, kind of going through this um, uh, once just to sort of understand some of the preconditions. So this uh, graph, you've probably seen versions of this. This is not our data, but it's our kind of graphic articulation of data from Architecture 2030. Um, the kind of dark squiggly line illustrates kind of where we've gotten to. Uh, and then these two broad kind of gray swaths represent where we're headed uh, with kind of current climate policies or no action at all. So this is what happens if we just keep going down the road that we're on. Uh, but this is actually where we need to be, right? Um, so we need to be at 65% uh, reduction in global carbon emissions by 2030, and we need to get to, 20, to net zero by 2050. This represents, a, obviously, a radical shift uh, in the way that we operate, um, and kind of looking very carefully at where this uh, carbon accumulates, what it is associated with. So we probably also know these statistics. Buildings, like what we do as architects, represents about 39% of global carbon, 28 in operational, 11 in embodied carbon. Um, that may not seem very much, 11%, uh, but if we actually look at the total carbon emissions associated with global new construction, in other words, new buildings that are going to be created over the course of the next 30 years, it's about half the carbon. Uh, if we actually look at more highly performing buildings, greater energy efficiency, it's more than half. Uh, and as, um, as we know, what's critical about embodied carbon, which is the carbon that goes into the processing materials and construction uh, of our buildings as opposed to their ongoing maintenance, energy, and operation, heating and cooling, uh, yeah. is that it's upfront carbon. That means that it's expended at the time of the construction of the building, uh, mm -hmm. whereas operational carbon accrues over the lifespan of the building. So what does this mean? Um, what can we do? What can we do as architects? Well, we cannot build. Um, that doesn't seem like the most terribly um, appealing option for architects. Uh, we can build less, we can build more efficiently, and we can reuse. Uh, but it's unlikely that we're going to reuse our way out of this situation. The projections are currently that the world will be adding about 2.5 trillion square feet of new buildings over the course of the next 30 years. That's essentially doubling the global building stock in three decades. Um, so what does this mean? Um, it means we have to seriously reconsider how we build and what we build with. It means we need to reassess the legacies of modernism with its reliance on steel, concrete, and glass, which are not only three of the most carbon-intensive materials, but are also based on extractive processes that have had devastating impacts 
on ecosystems and landscapes and inequitably di distributed effects on communities and human health. Uh, it also um, positions, modernism positions, the architect as a kind of consumer, as a specifier of products, uh, rather than an inventor of material systems. Um, so we think the alternative, or one of the important alternatives, is to work with biogenic and geogenic materials, which are either low carbon, or as in the case of plant-based materials, actually sequester carbon in their very cell structures. These materials are ubiquitous, they're widely distributed globally, they're generally inexpensive, they're frequently race products of other agro-industrial processes, uh, they require minimal processing, and in many cases, uh, we already know uh, a lot about how to build with them, right? Uh, so we know about how to build with these uh, products because they've been around for a while, right? So we're talking about these as if they're new, but in fact, they're paradoxically among the oldest forms of matter used for human construction. Uh, and there's a vast amount of indigenous knowledge and longstanding cultural practices associated uh, with their capacity as building elements. So we need to learn from this knowledge, absolutely, and kind of uh, benefit from it. But we also need to um, engage um, in a contemporary way what the potentials of these materials are. So manual biogenic house sections kind of looks at this question through the lens of 55 houses uh, called from around the world that represent not only uh, uh, biogenic and geogenic material assemblies, uh, but also innovative ways to think about dwelling in the 21st century. Um, so uh, why the house? This is an important question. It's one that we actually had a great deal of anxiety about when we were putting the book together uh, because we know the houses are part of the problem, right? We build too many single-family houses, about a million a year in North America alone. Uh, those houses are too big, uh, so they've increased in scale by about two and a half times between 1950 and 2020. Uh, and not only that, but they're actually built with the exception of the wood frame, largely out of toxic petrochemical derivative materials uh, that have um, uh, kind of negative effects on human health from asthma to cancer, uh, both in terms of the material processing, extraction, and manufacture, uh, which often ends up actually um, uh, nearby uh, disenfranchised uh, communities, uh, but also relative to the occupancy of these houses, right? That we're kind of living in these sort of toxic environments. Uh, the materials are predicated on a take-make-trash linear cycle, uh, meaning that they're very difficult to reprocess and most of them end up in landfill, right? But the house has historically been a kind of site of experimentation, right? So throughout modernism, for example, um, uh, new forms of kind of uh, tectonic and spatial assembly were played out in the context of the house. Uh, we know this history, and because of the very ubiquity and scale of the house, it becomes a potent vehicle for thinking about new material ecologies. Um, so let's, uh, if we take a kind of closer look at the wall section of the house, uh, we can see in a way part of the problem. Uh, which is the way we build houses now is actually through a multiplicity of very lightweight, thin, monofectional, and kind of hygienic layers that are based on a strict division between inside and outside. These are kind of single use, they're kind of monofunctional. Uh, they're very, very difficult to pull apart and reprocess for reuse, and they often operate at cross purposes to each other. By contrast, biogenic and geogenic systems tend towards thickness, they tend toward limited material components, and they often integrate multiple functions within a single monolithic mass, becoming simultaneously structure, skin, insulation, and envelope, a kind of symbiotic assembly in which the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, so again, we looked at a series of these assemblies. All of the houses were selected from different climatic and cultural contexts. They're all relatively small houses, around 1,000 square feet, so we weren't interested in exorbitant, luxurious uh, houses, but um, really kind of uh, more minimal constructions. Uh, and they all elevate the use of these materials uh, from an architectural standpoint. In other words, the encounter with materials uh, is um, kind of responded to in the design of the house in very particular and uh, inventive ways. Uh, so I'm going to go very quickly through um, uh, uh, these kind of nine different material systems, uh, talking probably very fast, um, but uh, in each of these instances, we, um, we look at the carbon sequestering potential of the material. Uh, we map each material's life cycle from field to form and back again, uh, repositioning the building not as a static moment or an isolated artifact, but rather as a kind of temporary accumulation of matter and energy that has an origin and an afterlife, uh, a kind of moment in a regenerative cycle of uh, material flows bound to the natural world. 
Uh, we look at the processing of the material, how it goes from the plant to the building component. This is really important in terms of questions of embodied carbon. Uh, and then we uh, 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 demonstrate through a series of houses in each category um, how this kind of translates into an architectural response. Uh, we do this through detailed axonometric drawings, photographs, and of course, uh, sectional perspectives uh, that look at this relationship between material assembly, spatial form, um, and uh, kind of operations of dwelling. Um, <coughs> so after about four years of working on the book, we obviously are now uh, folding back some of this thinking and work into our own uh, projects. So I'm going to be talking simultaneously about some of the projects uh, in the manual biogenic house sections along with uh, a series of five uh, experimental speculative houses that we've been developing that actually operate through different combinations of biogenic materials working usually in a kind of hybridized format to take advantage of different uh, properties within the materials. Um, and um, uh, so uh, to start with um, mass timber, this is probably the, the, boat, the most well-known of biogenic materials, uh, CLT. It's the most uh, kind of broadly adopted, the most kind of fully integrated into building codes and constructional processes. Um, and it's obviously has a fantastic potential to reduce embodied carbon relative to uh, uh, structural materials like steel and concrete. Um, but um, there are certain limits when we're talking about uh, uh, mass timber, um, the first of which is that trees take a long time to grow, right? A tree takes three 30 to 100 years to get to a state where it can be used as construction material. Um, if it's left alive, it continues to sequester that carbon. And even with carefully managed forest stewardship, um, the uh, cultivating or rather the felling of trees creates uh, kind of the release of carbon into the atmosphere, the disruption of soils and uh, ecosystems. Um, and third, only about 50% of any given tree is ever used, right? So about 50% of the material is returned as carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, so this isn't a kind of pure net win. Um, there are kind of complications involving the kind of use of uh, mass timber. But all of that said, it's a, a, a potentially um, kind of transformative system. And it's uh, frequently used as a substitute for a conventional structural systems, slabs, beams, and columns. Uh, in the book, we were really interested in finding houses that actually operated with the specific capacities of mass timber, of CLT, as this kind of panelized logic. Uh, so a house by uh, Jennifer Bonner, Mall Architects, uh, that uses the capacity to carefully and intricately tool these panels into complex geometries uh, to create this uh, kind of folded gabled roof, which actually becomes uh, the spatial uh, interior uh, kind of landscape for the house. Uh, project by Atelier Sotama uh, in uh, Finland for uh, the meteorite house, which nests a series of rectilinear uh, boxes within a more irregular enigmatic shell, uh, creating this kind of thick interstitial zone, uh, which acts as an insulative air cavity. Um, there are issues here with convection um, that um, I'm sure you might kind of wonder about, but apparently the house performs uh, quite well with this kind of uh, double skin. It reduces the use of other surfaces. It's only finished with a, an exterior stain uh, for waterproofing uh, reasons, and it eliminates insulation, uh, interior surfaces, and other uh, forms of uh, excessive surfaces. In our own project, in contrast to the sort of complex tooling that's uh, 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 possible with prefabricated CLT panels, uh, we're really interested in the capacity of the un uh, milled, the kind of minimally processed CLT blank, this, which typically comes in this sort of 10 by 50 foot scale. Um, so really thinking about this as a very, very large building component, uh, tilting up five pairs of panels um, that kind of uh, go from vertical uh, in the rear of the project, incrementally moving toward one another uh, to meet in the form of this attenuated triangle. Uh, at the front of the project. Um, the panels are interconnected uh, by a continuous CLT stair that kind of links from top to bottom, uh, leading to a, a roof level uh, kind of crow's nest with views into the surrounding treetops. Uh, and then within the house, that stairway extends into a series of platforms and sleeping lofts which take advantage of this very, very tall uh, sort of stretched triangulated space that's a kind of derivative of the scale of the CLT panel itself to create this kind of new form of a sort of a, a, a simple A-frame uh, construction. 
So bamboo actually takes us from the realm of the tree into the realm of grasses. Bamboo is not a, a tree, it's an arborescent grass with woody stems. Um, and uh, the primary advantage of bamboo is that it grows very, very fast. This is one of the world's fastest growing plants. So rather than 100 years, three to seven years to reach a point of kind of uh, constructional utility. Uh, and uh, moreover, because uh, bamboo uh, is actually a kind of rhizomatic system. Uh, the culling of uh, individual culms from the plant doesn't kill the plant, right? So uh, the tree, or rather the, the grass, the, the bamboo plant survives. Um, uh, this process, which is often accomplished through um, kind of uh, minimal means, um, uh, kind of hand uh, culling rather than kind of mechanical uh, felling of trees. Uh, there are a number of different ways of processing bamboo. Uh, kind of most commonly, it's uh, pressed, crushed, and laminated into sheet good materials like wall panels and flooring. Uh, but the full com comb can also be utilized, uh, bundled together and aggregated in different ways to create surfaces and structural elements. Um, uh, this very interesting house in Ecuador uses clusters of large indig ind indigenous combs uh, to create a structural frame. Uh, that uh, creates a kind of diagonal bracing in the house such that the entire section of the house is defined by a series of inclining surfaces or ramps punctuated by a series of multi-story voids. Um, Anna Herringer's uh, work with uh, in uh, experimental housing prototypes uh, here using this kind of uh, weaving of bamboo that's actually based on uh, local traditions in this part of China, kind of a basket weaving tradition to generate this uh, kind of complex outer uh, shell or, or veil which surrounds uh, an earthen core off of which are supported a series of sleeping platforms creating this kind of interstitial protected zone. Um, so, so earth is the next category and I'm going to go through this very quickly in deference to the fact that we have our own resident expert here at, at um, uh, GSAP and Lola Banalan, uh, who uh, kind of specializes in geogenic systems, but Earth is obviously uh, uh, has both structural and insulative capacity. It's ubiquitous, right? Inexpensive. It's inherently local, right? You can draw it from the site, and it's it's everywhere, right? Um, uh, the most typical ways of processing earth are either through compressed earth blocks, uh, through rammed earth construction, but also um, in a more contemporary event through uh, 3D printing. So again, the utilization of earth can range from very, very kind of basic low-tech techniques. Uh, this is a project by von, called Von Haas Fleury um, by Space Shop Architects in Switzerland, which uh, involves the use of cob walls that are manually uh, constructed cob is a combination of clay and straw uh, and creating these very long uh, kind of beautiful walls that become a kind of uh, interior feature but also the kind of structural and insulative uh, component of the house with these long uh, overhanging roofs insulated by straw which provide kind of the erosion control for the house. It's a detailed kind of blow up of that section. And then the other end of the spectrum, a uh, company called Wasp operating outside of Bologna, Italy, uh, which operates through the 3D printing um, of clay. Uh, here working with the architect Mario Cucinella to pr produce this kind of dome-like or beehive-like construction of multiple layers uh, of uh, uh, structural layers creating a 30-inch thick wall that's filled with uh, rice husks for their insulative capacity um, and kind of, uh, uh, kind of capping the entire thing with a series of skylights to create these uh, almost cave-like uh, but daylight interior environments. So in our project for the Lamella Earth House, we were kind of interested in this kind of necessity to kind of protect uh, the uh, kind of earthen walls, which are kind of subject to erosion, utilizing the kind of efficiency and strength of bamboo. Uh, so the project actually consists of an extruded lamella arch, uh, a kind of a long uh, a lamella vault that works with the kind of uh, limited eight-foot lengths of bamboo, repetitive joints to create an efficient, long-spanning structure. Uh, within that structure, which is clad uh, partially with bioplastic to allow for solar gain to create a kind of greenhouse-like uh, environment and clad on the north side by reed-based thatch that protects it from uh, wind and rain. Uh, within that uh, kind of interstitial environment, we lodge uh, 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 an earthen-based uh, set of living quarters that are excavated from and built from the soil of the site um, and are housed within. Uh, this passively climatized buffer zone that acts as productive garden as an extension uh, of the public uh, collective spaces of the house and shields the uh, uh, earthen dwelling from the deleterious effects of wind and rain. 
So the next three things I'm going to talk about, the last three things I promise are all insulation. So I know you guys are getting really excited about hearing about insulation. If you're coming to a lecture at GSAP, you're probably thinking, I really want to hear about insulation. Um, so insulation is obviously not the sexiest uh, aspect of architecture. And for many years, uh, I admit, we, it was also something we didn't put a lot of thought to, right? It's hidden within the walls, it's invisible. Uh, but not only does it perform, you know, it's incredibly important, obviously, in the uh, thermal operation of our buildings, uh, but what we use for, for insulation conventionally in buildings uh, is often, uh, as I was alluding to earlier, very um, toxic, EPS, uh, XPS, uh, spray foam, fiberglass bat insulation, these are all uh, pretty nasty um, uh, characters, right? So uh, one of the great things about biogenic materials is that there are many forms that are actually really effective as insulation. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to talk about hemp only briefly here. Uh, but hemp, which was actually I illegal to grow for many years in this country from the 1970s to about 2018, uh, because of its association with uh, marijuana. It's not the same plant. Uh, but because of the war on drugs, you couldn't grow it here until uh, relatively recently. Hemp is an incredibly robust and useful plant. It grows in degraded soil. It requires minimal fertilizer and water. Um, and it generates a lot of really useful effects, both a kind of fiber stock, but then internal to that stock, uh, what's called the herd. Uh, the herd is the part of the plant that's combined frequently with lime to form what's called hempcrete, uh, which uh, sometimes is erroneously called, uh, uh, well, is correctly called hemp lime, but is often erroneously called hempcrete. It's not a substitute for concrete. It doesn't actually have uh, structural capacity to speak of, but it is a, a fantastic insulator. Uh, it can be uh, sprayed or compacted into walls. It can be uh, 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 fabricated as pre-manufactured blocks and assembled into larger panels. Um, Another fantastic insulating material is cork, and cork really is, is truly multi-purpose. Um, it is fungally resistant, it's water resistant, it's uh, thermally insulative, and even has structural capacity, um, compressive strength. Uh, the difficulty with cork is that it's, um, it, it only grows in very limited parts of the world, right? So most of the cork in the world is grown um, in uh, the Iberian Peninsula, in northern Africa, and it's part of a very complex agroforestry uh, ecosystem. Um, that actually requires the kind of hand cultivation of the bark of the co cork oak. That's what cork is. Um, that happens in a periodic basis. So once the trees reach maturity, they can be essentially sheared like sheep uh, without killing the tree, and the cork grows back on cycles of about 9 to 12 years. Um, these uh, trees are protected, but most of that cork uh, goes into the wine stopper industry, believe it or not, which is a huge industry. Um, so almost all of the material that we use uh, in building products is really the waste product of uh, the cork stopper. So what's left over from that is granulated. Uh, it's uh, adhered to itself either through adhesives or preferably through an autoclaving process, which actually activates the naturally occurring binders in the cork. So it's kind of self-adhering uh, if treated thermally. Um, and it, it's most commonly um, uh, deployed in the form of sheet goods, right? Um, uh, wall panels, flooring surfaces. Uh, but this is a really fantastic house um, in England called Workhouse, obviously enough, uh, which really kind of uses uh, almost exclusively cork as a mono material to create uh, structure, insulation, uh, exterior envelope, waterproofing, uh, and interior finish, right? So uh, all of these kinds of qualities of cork, uh, in this case translated into uh, 1,286 CNC custom milled blocks, which are interlocked uh, to create this uh, kind of corbelled or beehive vault shape uh, that then articulates a series of rooms uh, below these sort of skylit um, uh, kind of pyramidal uh, roofscapes. Uh, and with the exception of the, uh, the spiral foundations, a CLT platform, and a series of timber ring beams, the entire house is really one material. It's all cork. Um, so kind of fantastic capacity, really, for these biogenic materials to become almost a form of vegetal masonry, if you will, um, that actually performs at kind of multiple scales in, in multiple ways. So the final um, material I'm going to talk about tonight is straw. Um, and straw is ubiquitous uh, around the world. Basically, straw is distinct from hay, which is a feedstock. Straw is essentially what's left over from the processing of cereal grain crops, right? So uh, wheat, rice, oats, barley, whatever, what have you. So anywhere in the world that people eat grain, which is everywhere in the world, um, you have straw. 
Um, <coughs> and straw is, uh, has fantastic insulating capacity, but is generally, um, uh, because of its status as a waste product, uh, frequently left to decay and degrade in the field, right? So um, cor uh, straw, on the other hand, because of the predominance of grain crops, um, has the potential to sequester enormous amounts of carbon. Um, according to one calculation, the amount of carbon um, that's represented by one year of straw uh, in the world is equivalent uh, to all of the carbon generated by concrete construction within that same year, right? Um, so if we can recapture this carbon and kind of utilize it, uh, sequester it, um, it's a kind of huge potential advantage um, rather than kind of returning it back into the atmosphere, which is typically what happens now. Uh, so straw, of course, uh, is uh, frequently bound into bales. Uh, and in fact, as early as the 1800s in Nebraska, this uh, uh, Nebraska load-bearing system essentially just utilized the ready-made agricultural artifact of the bale as essentially a building block uh, to create structures. Many of those structures 120 years later actually still exist. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, this idea about durability and, and how long these structures can uh, be maintained is a really interesting uh, question, but certainly it, it's possible. Um, uh, straw needs to be protected by, um, in most cases, a layer of uh, lime or clay-based plaster that uh, prevents the infiltration of uh, mold and uh, vermin and other kinds of um, uh, critters um, uh, from the interior surface. But it has both thermal capacity and also can act as structure. Um, uh, it's also frequently used as an infill for structural insulated panels, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, this is a kind of fascinating project by Atelier uh, Schmidt, uh, Werner Schmidt, who's doing a lot of really interesting work with straw. Uh, this kind of corbelled uh, pavilion, which as you can see, it, it kind of exhibits this sort of massively thick uh, straw wall using here jumbo bales, which are very large bales. They weigh about 600 pounds each. Uh, creating this uh, uh, kind of internal uh, domestic space uh, under this super thick insulating structural blanket that happens to uh, kind of contain about 75 metric tons of agricultural waste uh, and which sequesters about 83,000 kilograms of CO2. Uh, so we really became fascinated by this capacity of straw uh, to be both thick and efficient, right? Um, and so we developed a series of houses um, that look at this kind of question of mass in relationship to um, uh, a, a series of dwelling projects. So uh, the first is called Straw Bale Spiral House. Uh, the house works through a combination of two contrasting materials, CLTs and straw, uh, with the space of the CLT units carving voids into the mass of the straw. Uh, so essentially, uh, the straw bales, these jumbo straw bales, are stacked up into a hollow cube. Uh, and combined with a series of prefabricated CLT uh, mass timber modules, each of which corresponds to one of the programmatic rooms of the house. Uh, the bales support the CLT modules, and the CLT modules stabilize the bales, kind of creating this sort of reciprocal exchange. The entire assembly is capped by a stress skin roof with a central skylight, which can be shaded, uh, and which extends into a series of cantilevered eaves to protect the lime uh, clay plaster on the exterior of the house. Um, and the rooms of the house essentially form a continuous spiral from front door uh, to roof uh, terrace, interconnected uh, by a stair, uh, open at both ends to create this interior condition, which is simultaneously thick uh, and porous, um, highly kind of introverted, but extroverted at the same time. Um, so with Mass Straw House, we were really interested in this idea that we could make a house that's actually more mass than space. Um, and kind of capitalize on this kind of logic of the straw bales. So here the house is really formed by two dis different ways of stacking straw bales, one a kind of corbelled wall and the other a kind of terrace stack. Uh, those two elements are connected by a series of timber box beams which are actually insulated by additional straw, capped by a hemp fiber uh, membrane, and then an additional sacrificial layer of unprotected straw uh, at is added on top in the form of a decomposing green roof. Uh, so we liked very much the idea that the house would begin to decay, decay back into the site uh, uh, over time, kind of, you know, engaging uh, in a productive way in tropic processes. Um, the main space of the house is uh, essentially uh, contained between these two systems and exists as a kind of, uh, kind of terraced interior landscape uh, with private spaces carved into the thickness of the, m of the straw itself, uh, creating this condition again where um, there's kind of as much 
stuff as there is occupiable space. Uh, and we were kind of fascinated by this possibility that thickness, which is usually conceived in negative terms, indicative of a lack of material optimization, is here kind of exploited both for its kind of idiosyncratic spatial characteristics, but also for its thermal, structural, and carbon sequestering benefits. In other words, if the material is cheap, it's plentiful, and the more of it we use, the better the house performs, uh, then paradoxically, the excessive becomes efficient. So um, two very, very uh, kind of last uh, things. These are kind of ongoing work in the office and things we're kind of pursuing now. Uh, one is a set of material experiments, um, and with the caveat that we're not material scientists, but really just kind of fascinated in, in, uh, about the possibilities these, of these materials. Uh, and as, as I was alluding to earlier, um, uh, there are a whole series of interesting products that are hitting the market uh, in the last several years, from EcoCocon uh, to AlphaWall to Croft, a company that actually works out of Rockland, Maine. Uh, these are essentially structural insulated panels. In other words, they're stick frame or timber structural panels that are filled with compressed straw, uh, utilizing it for its insulative capacity. Um, these are great systems. They're uh, potentially really useful. Uh, they have all kinds of uh, interesting efficiencies and architectural implications, uh, but they don't take advantage of what we think is the most fascinating condition of straw, which is that it's both thermal, insulative, and structural. Um, so we really were, are really curious about this idea of how can we uh, think about combining those uh, capacities. So um, this summer we built a compression table so we could conduct some of these experiments ourselves uh, that allowed us to kind of compress the straw to a much higher degree of compression than the standard straw bale. Uh, but once it's compressed, it has to stay in that form or we lose its uh, uh, kind of uh, these new capacities. So we have been experimenting with a series of binders uh, this is mycelium, uh, but working with a variety of elements from earth to lime um, to various adhesives, um, uh, uh, even cement, just to sort of see uh, how this kind of evolves, uh, working with the idea of a kind of a stress skin panel with these more highly compressed straw interiors uh, to kind of take advantage of this dual capacity of structure and thermal regulation. We, we cut these uh, 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 elements down uh, to test them within the kind of instron compression machine, um, and you get this very, very strange effect where there's almost no lateral deformation. By the way, this is sped up about 15 times. Uh, and then this sort of bounce back, right? So rather than conventional materials, which basically are rigid up to a point and then fail catastrophically, uh, straw just keeps kind of compressing at a certain level, right? So it behaves very, very differently from kind of conventional uh, logics of even timber um, as a structural material. And so the question becomes, how do you kind of maximize the resistant capacity of the straw from a structural standpoint without actually compromising its thermal capacity? Because the denser the straw becomes, uh, you actually risk kind of losing some of its insulated property, which is based on the entrained air within the straw units themselves. Anyway, so all of this is to say, we're, we're kind of working with this. We're now testing the thermal capacity of these elements. And you can see here, very preliminary, inconclusive, and um, needs to be further tested, but the, uh, the standard foam is by far the worst in terms of its insulative capacity relative to these um, other kind of con conglomerates that we've been operating with. So the final project uh, ex experiment with straw um, is um, kind of based on this kind of ubiquitous feature of the American landscape. You probably kind of see this when you drive across the middle of the country, right? These very, very large Ron straw bales, uh, which are actually more compressed by virtue of their size. They're uh, closer to 140 kilograms per cubic meter uh, in terms of their density, which is denser than the normal straw bale. Uh, they're very large, they're inexpensive. Um, they can be moved around by a single piece of equipment. And we became really interested in how this very strange element might actually become a building component. Uh, we began sort of kind of uh, experimenting with this idea of an overscaled column that's a thick wall that can be carved reposition that can uh, kind of create both figure and field, can become more or less kind of organized or more or less randomized that can be stacked up to create new kind of spatial characteristics. And then we began to think about it relative to a project that Dean Hake mentioned earlier, which is the uh, Helen Walton uh, Children's Enrichment Center. So this is a project for an early childhood education center that we developed uh, a couple of years ago. Um, the premise of the project was that, and this is a, basically a center for very young children up to about the age of four, uh, and the ethos of the center was that all of the, uh, the children would have kind of immediate and continuous access to exterior space, right? These landscapes uh, designed by Scape 
uh, in collaboration with SCAPE, uh, see here on the left. Uh, and even within inclement weather, um, all year round, the students would have these kind of porch-like, terrace-like elements, um, and um, uh, kind of the activity of play uh, was seen as kind of um, absolutely integral to the educational property. Um, however, this project, uh, although we worked very hard to eliminate toxic materials, actually there's no plastics, no VOCs, um, the toys are wooden and the paint is mineral-based, um, uh, and that was uh, really kind of critical to us. But the structural systems are conventional, right? So we were using here steel um, joists, steel studs, uh, sheetrock. And so we began to think about, uh, is there a way based on these experiences in Arkansas to think about a need for similar facilities throughout underserved communities in the rural south, uh, where there is simultaneously a surplus um, of agricultural waste in the form of these very large jumbo round straw bales. So we developed a prototypical system, a kind of wall system, um, that uses a kind of a chaining together of these round bales, kind of double stacked to form these kind of columnar walls uh, that could then uh, act as insulation uh, at their kind of thinnest point. It's about, these things are like R70 there in terms of their mass, capped by a CLT plate in a series of reciprocal beams. Um, so um, these uh, straw bales are, again, arranged in a circular formation. Uh, they're capped by a series of reciprocal LVL beams uh, that create a kind of oculus at the center of each room, uh, creating v these very sort of thick insulative environments which are simultaneously open to exterior yards. Uh, so the uh, thick walls become inhabitable and the bales extend into a series of exterior playscapes, uh, creating the kind of required kind of uh, secure enclosure um, out in the landscape. Um, and the entire kind of assemblage uh, operates through the pairing of classrooms uh, with uh, similarly scaled classroom around a shared service core uh, and an extended uh, kind of uh, extension of those straw bales into the landscape uh, to create both a shared uh, play space, age appropriate play space for the children, uh, but also we really like this idea that those same straw bales that form the structure of the building could extend into the adjacent uh, kind of agricultural territory, degrade uh, and decay into the landscape become to become a substrate for a series of vegetable gardens that feed uh, the children who live in the school. So um, uh, I'm going to uh, stop there and just uh, um, maybe as a kind of brief summary, we're, we're, um, these are all kind of experiments in process. These are all things that we're uh, kind of uh, working on uh, continuously and each of these instances we're really I'm interested in how an encounter with the specific characteristics of these material systems can become a kind of catalyst for rethinking architectural form, performance, and inhabitation, um, and how this really kind of shifts the meaning and relevance of a whole series of terms like optimization and standardization, maintenance and repair, efficiency and excess, durability and entropy. Uh, and we're like super optimistic about the capacity of engaging regenerative materials. Uh, and their capacity to foster response that's actually more powerful and enduring than that of modernism's instrumentalization of extractive uh, processes and materials, re-engaging architects with regenerative cycles uh, and creating the potential for new imaginative ways of buildings that are tied to a more convivial relationship to natural systems, to other beings, uh, and to the earth. Um, so thank you. Amazing. <laughs> we've seen everything. Uh, we've seen basically uh, from machines that are compressing uh, hemp and straw and uh, uh, to books and to examples uh, of architecture from all around that we've seen. I have, and I have a question because normally this kind of broad spectrum of registers um, is not something that we're used to see in a lecture like this. Uh, normally we see architects presenting their portfolio with very nice uh, photographs, uh, a few plans and a few anecdotes. But I have the feeling that there's an expansion of the material that is presented here. And somehow, you know, I have the feeling that normally architects try to hide that. Uh, there's a lot of research and, and let's say work that is done at the offices that uh, kept secret. Uh, and I remember when I graduated from the School of Architecture, one of the, my first jobs was interviewing people for El Croquis magazine. So the first thing that everyone would bring is an NDA. You're going to see many things. You're not allowed to publish them. You're not allowed to talk about them. We will tell you what you have, uh, we, what, what you can do. But somehow there's an effort here of showing much more, sharing much more. 
And actually, I have the feeling that we see uh, a change of in the way that you see the profession. Somehow, research and experimentation, I would say, uh, the, let's say the outcome of your work, uh, processes that, that are kind of allowing you to, to analyze other examples or cases of architecture, and even the way different sites, like the, the harvest site as the construction site, uh, and the construction as interconnected are part of a larger, let's say, uh, laboratory where architecture is, is, is sort of emerging. So I want to ask you specifically to start this conversation about that. Mm -hmm. What is the way that you see the interaction between this experimentation, the profession, and also sort of something that I don't know how to call, which is sort of uh, influence, uh, diffusion, uh, or even activism uh, within the material realm of how uh, we operate. Uh, but definitely there's a change in the way these different realms are articulated in your practice. And mm. I, I'd like to know more about how, mm. how basically you, you came to this. <coughs> yeah, thanks for the question. Hopefully it's not indicative of the fact that I overshared. But, <laughs> 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 but, um, but yeah, no, I, I mean, I think, you're, I think it, it hits on a number of really Im important points. One is that, you know, I think we've given that lecture that you're describing many, many mm -hmm. times, right? Of kind of, you know, here's our work, this is the project, these are the highly composed photographs. And, and um, you know, I wanted to give a little bit of that tonight, but I think we're at a place of transition in our own practice where I think some of the things we're most interested in at the moment don't mm -hmm. actually um, materialize in that format. Yeah. Yet, right? So there are things that I didn't show. There are things that we're working on now, and there's a, a, a couple of client-driven projects that I can't speak to, but which hopefully um, will be available and you know, kind of to to um, share in the near future. That actually are taking some of these ideas and then kind of deploying them relative to, in one instance, uh, uh, an educational institutional project, and in the other case, um, a kind of large-scale kind of rehabilitation of an existing building. Um, but, you know, we, we really do see this really as, a, a, as an exchange, right? Like the, the manuals for us and the process of constructing them, of making them, are first of all an exchange with the architects that we're featuring, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of this, this is by and large not our work. We're kind of learning from and engaging with architects from around the world. Um, so we're also in the context of that building a kind of yeah. network and a kind of community, mm -hmm. uh, as it were. Um, and then we're uh, kind of working in collaboration, right, with a whole series, obviously, of, you know, that, that aren't, uh, I didn't specifically denote here, but a whole series of collaborators at, at different scales, right, clients, engineers, like all architects are doing, and with the kind of fantastic people kind of within our office. But part of it's kind of emblematic of the fact that I think we're trying to find a new way of operating, right? Yeah. And so a lot of the more kind of conventional ways of talking about work or of lecturing about work um, seem inadequate, right, to kind of talk about the things that are most concerning to us. And, and frankly, there is a moment of kind of uncertainty, right, where sort of these are things in mm -hmm. development, these things are in a kind of initial kind of nascent stage and we're kind of struggling through kind of capacities and possibilities and, and uh, a, a kind of research, right? So you're s it's a kind of a research that's, yeah. that's in process. And, and I, you know, there's maybe a, a naivete about kind of disseminating mm -hmm. that and kind of opening it up. I mean, we, um, you know, uh, we did this project um, at the beginning of the pandemic called Manual of Physical Distancing, yes. which was essentially a kind of documentation uh, that deployed the techniques of architectural representation to visualize the best available science at the time about transmission, proximity, spatialization of, um, of the virus. Um, and we, you know, we made it available online as a kind of free accessible resource, which may not have been the wisest thing mm -hmm. to do from a kind of legal, kind of self-protective mm -hmm. perspective, uh, but we really wanted to contribute in a productive and direct way to yeah. a kind of ongoing kind of moment of crisis, right? Mm -hmm. um, and to use the tools that we had at our disposal to, to do that, right? And so um, maybe there's a kind of, um, you know, moment in the practice now where we're, you know, questioning a lot of the underpinnings of what we've done in the past and the kind of basis of the way that we've oper we've sort of, you know, conducted work. I mean, you know, it, it does involve 
you know, uh, client conversations that are sometimes uncomfortable. It, it, you know, it's certainly, you know, in all uh, transparency, it's probably meant that a few projects that we would have had access to, we didn't, and we had to kind of step back from a certain amount of work because of um, uh, these questions that we think are so vital to the kind of future of the discipline. Um, but we think that's that's Im important, right? Yeah. And if there's a certain amount of, of kind of um, kind of exposure related to that, maybe that's yeah. that's all for the that that's a positive thing as well. And it kind of hopefully fosters a, a kind of exchange rather than this kind of you know sort of passive reception of yeah. things where we're sort of delivering information that um, uh, you know this is all kind of it's it's evolving, it's emerging, it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of a state in a state of change. Right. It, it was, I, I love the fact that you started with the project in Coney Island, because in a way I think that there's two directions of your work. One it's, uh, when you were accounting for Coney Island, there was all these emergencies, I would say, like basically Sandy came and then the, the, there was all these different types of wood that would be, uh, basically differentiated by Sandy, those that were destroyed, those mm -hmm. that were recyclable, that's, and there, there's other things that you found, like the fishermen would go there, the, the, the others, other people would do that, other things, and would happen. You know, it's, it's, there's a cert, certain feeling of messiness mm. in the way that you account for projects that have that trajectory in which all these presences are manifesting uh, in, let's say, unpredictable ways. Uh, in the way that you connect other sides to the analysis that you're presenting of existing projects, there seems to be a predetermination of what are the parts that you're going to mm. look at. For instance, you're going to look at the, uh, where the material is sourced mm. from, uh, what is the way that it works thermally and structurally, and the, but maybe there's I mean, there's always surprises. Like, for instance, I love the fact that there's the rabbits there in the mass of the house. And the, but somehow there's a sense of control on mm. what is mm. that that you're going to be paying attention to. Mm. I wonder why these two directions are so different, you know, mm. whereas one seems to be unpredictably finding alliances and, and, and associations, and, and the other seems to be much more prescriptive in, mm. the, in the way that, uh, and I wonder why, why that happens and, and what is your take on that? Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I mean, I, I guess the, my initial take on it is, to say, is that um, in relationship to the content of the book, where we were um, working within the, let's say the language of, um, you know, in a way it's kind of comes back to this notion of the manual, mm -hmm. right? And the necessity that we, uh, which was true in the first book as well, which was developing a kind of consistent set of graphic representational conventions that would allow in that case, the kind of cross comparative analysis of these different yeah. works of architecture um, so that you could understand them in relationship to each other. Um, but in the context of the, the new book, um, yeah. you know, it's thinking similarly about these material systems in a way that is systematized in its representation to allow for uh, a certain amount of kind of immediate accessibility to that information, yeah. right, if that makes sense. So uh, part of it has to do with format, part of it has, has to do with how do we make um, a kind of complex information um, readily uh, accessible, right, to the to the reader, to the viewer, yeah. to the observer. Um, and the, you know, the intent, you know, we, we recognize absolutely that um, there are, you know, there are books that get into incredibly intricate detail, right, about every nuance of bamboo, right, every potential kind of, fu you know, functional usage, artistic tradition, kind of uh, cultural implication, you know, structural joint. Yeah. Um, and in the, the kind of survey quality of the book, which was about consolidating that information into a, a kind of compendium, right, yeah. um, where this information could be uh, kind of um, uh, I I at a very kind of immediate level absorbed, that wasn't kind of possible for us, yeah. right? So that meant a certain amount of standardization in relationship to the representational kind of techniques, and maybe that's what, what, what I'm, what I'm um, kind of getting out of your question um, in terms of how we kind of assess the viability. Yeah. It's also maybe responding to the fact that if you're making an argument for these material systems which are not kind of readily acceptable that have a whole series of kind of complicated issues in terms of how they get incorporated into 
uh, everything from code to kind of uh, constructional logistics um, to liability questions, right? Um, that there's a certain kind of necessity to kind of represent and document, right, the, inf the information at hand in, in, in that way, right? So that this is, you know, it's a kind of uh, toolkit in a sense, right? And by virtue of being a toolkit, um, maybe some of those kind of accidents that some of those kind of idiosyncratic elements yeah. end up being smoothed out. Hopefully they're more visible in the projects themselves, I think, because each of those sort of plays it out in, in kind of disparate ways and, and, and kind of looks yeah. at different qualities of these materials, right? I mean, something that is fascinating, like normally we would see, you know, in, in, in lectures like this, we would see people that could bring amazing houses that they built and, that, and then drawings of big buildings that they would like to do, right? Here is the opposite. <laughs> Basically, we see huge buildings that are built and then we see tiny houses that are uh, the, the, where your, your experimentation goes, right? Yeah. And I, I'm surprised by that because in a way it's, it's indicating something of a shift in the way you're working. And then it comes like the, the last project that you saw, the children's uh, building that yeah. I, I love, you were, you were expressing your frustration of maybe, or not frustration, but basically, oh, we, we didn't manage to do the, the structure. It's very conventional in a way, as opposed to the ambition mm, that mm. you have in the, in the uh, or the kind of the work that you're making the structure of your houses, your own houses uh, do. So I, I think that I, th th I, I have a question about scale. Mm. Uh, yeah. And what is the relationship of scale with experimentation? What is the way that you see um, things that happen at one scale moving to other scales? And what is that that takes to do that? Because in a way your, your uh, manual is showing a little bit of a happy uh, uh, description of how this happens. It's not showing the reservations or the difficulties of making the timber come or basically doing a house with timber or, or doing thick walls that are, uh, but, but I, I have the feeling that in the way you're presenting it and you're allocating let's say the most ambitious part of your material experimentation in these houses, mm. and then accepting more of a, of a negotiation uh, in the larger buildings, mm. there's a lot to learn about how things move from the scale of what you can control to, to bring other actors in and making that something that is broader participated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and, it, and it's, a, it is, it's exactly right. What you're noting is is absolutely true, and there's this kind of maybe perverse way in which, it, at at this kind of relatively kind of advanced stage in our careers, we're actually we're actually designing smaller projects as a kind of space in, in that create a space of speculation about these materials. Um, it correlates in some way to the identification of the house as the site of experimentation um, in in the manual in general, and that was a kind of recognition that. In fact, when you look at a lot of these materials, where they're being kind of deployed, where people are kind of using them in construction is in a sense out of, you know, kind of necessity in smaller yeah. scale constructions like houses, right? Um, where it's more difficult to imagine there, you know, because of all of the other kind of impediments that kind of the profession brings with it, uh, large scale implementation comes with another set of challenges yeah. that are often circumvented in the context of the, of the, of the dwelling. Um, and that was that was a point of anxiety and 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 for us a kind of insecurity mm -hmm. because um, we were you know that whole question of the house is an incredibly complex one and problematic one. Uh, but the other kind of uh, realities was was that the the drawing of a uh, relatively smaller scale building like a house allowed for a magnified scrutiny of the kind of material constituency yeah. of the building, right? Mm -hmm. So in a manual of section, the very very large buildings you could kind of make kind of, you could convey aspects of their spatial organization, their kind of social condition, um, but it was very difficult to convey kind of in a detailed way um, uh, questions about tectonics, material assembly, et cetera. Um, and we realized that the smaller scale buildings, which were, there were a few houses, um, a number of houses in the original publication, allowed for that kind of level of um, attention, right, yeah. to the specificity of that and to, to draw it out, to make it visible, to kind of render it meaningful and legible in a way. Um, and so the scale is on the one hand relating to that, right, mm -hmm. that condition. Uh, and so that when we kind of started to kind of deploy some of these materials in our own kind of speculative um, kind of design work, um, that became a, a kind of a natural kind of outgrowth yeah. of that. Um, the question of scalability is absolutely a, a really kind of critical one, and we're now kind of looking at 
what that means, you know, moving beyond the kind of realm of the house and looking at larger scale configurations and implementations of this and uh, that's happening. But it, 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 it is, you know, it, the earlier projects, most of the projects that I showed were um, before the last few years. Um, we now have a kind of a new range of projects, obviously, that are in, in production. Um, but really, in a sense, came before a lot of these realizations for us, right? That they, they were working um, in a realm where maybe those questions hadn't come in, in as forceful a way to the foreground. Um, and so uh, obviously we re we've always, you know, materiality is something that's always obsessed us uh, mm. from the earliest kind of projects that we did. Um, very, very small scale projects in many cases, but kind of very materially intensive. Um, but not necessarily in the in the same way and not necessarily using the same metrics, yeah. right? So, um, so yeah, absolutely. We, we don't necessarily see the, the house as a scalar limit, but we do recognize that moving kind of beyond that scale into kind of larger and larger um, uh, projects um, requires a different set of operations and transformations and, and engagements. On the other hand, you know, I, I think maybe we're also at a point where building the biggest building is no longer the most, right? Yes. Ne necessarily something, right? It isn't necessarily about building more, right? Building kind of uh, more kind of grandiose buildings, more and more kind of grandiose structures that's got us into trouble, right? At some level, that's part of the problematic. Um, so I think the modesty in a way of the scale um, is something that we're, we're at least kind of initially sort of embracing, right? Um, and trying to move beyond the notion, right, of, um, uh, you know, the, 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 s the scale of the building being a virtue in and of itself. Yeah. And maybe the dissemination also, because your books are probably the most, w I mean, I, 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 I'm always amazed that they're among the best sellers in architecture, right, in Amazon, and, the, and so that dissemination probably will. But maybe we can open it to two questions from the audience, and there's one there, and then Mario, let's start there with the, yeah. Hello. Um, Mark, first of all, thank you so much for a wonderful, super informative and exciting presentation. Um, it's actually so fitting to what I'm going to talk about in my elective tomorrow morning. <laughs> I was hoping that maybe, <laughs> and I see only one person from my elective um, <laughs> present. So ah, there's two more there. Two more there. <laughs> oh, oh sorry, there. more, yeah, more. Back, thank yes. you so much. <laughs> you you have a good grade already. <laughs> um, so I'm already wondering if the video on YouTube is going to be uploaded by tomorrow morning at 9 a.m.? <laughs> We'll see about that. Um, Mark, I really appreciate the manuals. They are incredibly important in the, in the canon uh, when teaching architecture, not only for incredibly strong graphics, but also on the, all the information and innovation over there. Yeah. Um, but I want what I appreciate most is the pushing the materials out of boundaries and actually not only taking what is out there on the market, but trying to um, create new pieces, new yeah. structural systems. Uh, which is a very big inspiration, not only for us, your colleagues, but also uh, most of all the students. Um, and here, this is leading me into the question because I do have a question, <laughs> <laughs> bear with me. Um, I wanted to ask you about those nine chapters in the last manual. Um, and I have kind of a uh, egg, hen, egg, chicken mm. kind of question. I really like, um, I know how difficult it is to write a book and select the right case studies that would be drawn or discussed. But uh, I find it fascinating that you always can show your own examples from mm. LTL. And I'm wondering, what comes first? Do mm. you say straw? OK, we're going to write about straw. Let's make a project about straw that we can put in the into the book. Or was it the other way around? Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a really yeah interesting question. It is a chicken and the egg, although I will say that the the projects, those projects that I showed tonight are not in the book. They're mm -hmm. in a kind of a second publication that's more, has a more limited release. Um, but we did have projects in the initial manual of section, included our own work in that. And, you know, and it, in some level, it's what the question that you're asking is exactly the point. So the exact, the, the reason that we generate these manuals. I mean, yes, on the one hand, um, we hope they become kind of useful documents for students of architecture, for ar architects in general, for the discipline and initiate a kind of discourse and a conversation mm -hmm. around these topics. Um, and, you know, I guess we've come to recognize that our particular skill set, whatever that is, maybe kind of has allowed us to do that in a certain way. Um, 
but they're also really documents for us, right? That they're, they're generated out of the things that we're obsessed and fascinated by at the time. So, you know, we, we always, uh, we historically kind of deployed sectional perspectives in our own work. Actually, they're very different from the drawings in the book in many ways, the, the ways that we developed them were very different, um, but they kind of contributed to this notion, right, of okay, how do we think about this? Also as teachers working with students all the time, we also were faced with this kind of, you know, this kind of maybe void within architectural education that we were uh, trying to mitigate and thinking about how section had you know, become a kind of retroactive document that was generated as a, a kind of secondary effect of a digital model rather than seen as a kind of generative and instrumental tool for developing the project. Um, and so we thought, you know, that was something that we could, we could kind of contribute to the kind of conversation. Of course, having gone through that exercise and gone through the kind of, uh, let's say in that case, the typological classification of the buildings and the emergence of a set of structural operational uh, kind of, um, uh, logics um, uh, that you know absolutely kind of folds back into the way that we think about our own work um, and in the context of the manual biogenic house sections book it was absolutely came out of a an interest in these materials again we you know there some of our earliest projects when I think about them were you know we're working with things like felt and bamboo mm -hmm. and cardboard right these very sort of normative um, uh, generic and expensive materials natural materials um, and, um, and maybe we had felt, I mean, a bit, as you allude to in the HWCC project, as much as we like many aspects of the project, that the materiality had started to kind of reach a stage of kind of neutralization in a way, right? It was less mm -hmm. um, impactful, right, in yeah. the conceptualization of the work, right? Um, and, um, the, and, and also this kind of inherent frustration, right, that as architects were continuously dealing with, like, what's available? What can I specify? Um, what can I put into the, the document, right, that meets all of the requirements? Um, and so I think that um, in the case of the, the straw projects that we're working on now, they, they kind of emerge sort of simultaneous with the work on the book. Um, and as we were kind of, you know, for us, it's an amazing, it's always like this sort of instructive process, right? Because we're working closely with these architects in many cases. You know, one of the fantastic things that came out of manual section is we have like full drawing sets of Buckminster Fuller and, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright projects, <laughs> right? Um, and, and this, you know, same with the houses, um, uh, kind of smaller scale of documentation, less well-known projects by, um, you know, it was our intention actually was to select kind of lesser known projects, smaller projects from around the world. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a kind of continuously sort of revolving feedback loop between uh, the research which drives the speculative work, the speculative work kind of folding into the built work and the built work then kind of raising questions that then kind of generates kind of the next set of research possibilities for us, right? And that, that kind of cycle, which I think is part mm -hmm. of, you know, parcel of, you know, TSAP and the way we kind of operate here and this kind of continually kind of, um, uh, this way of continually asking questions uh, mm -hmm. and then finding kind of ways um, you know, direct ways, indirect ways, uh, speculative ways to think about them. Um, uh, I don't know if I answered the question, but yes, they, they emerge together. They kind of, they, and they inform one another um, uh, on an ongoing basis. So I think, you know, again, the books, in a way, there is much for us, in, in a sense, uh, as they are, right, for um, the kind of larger audience that we hope that they find. Right. Mario? Thanks, uh, Mark, really uh, fantastic talking. Thanks for the generosity of, of sharing all of this work. I mean, I'm, I wanna go back to the question of representation, of architectural representation, mm -hmm. and you answered this partially and the Dean has kind of alluded to this, but it seems to me that there's perhaps something a bit sneaky and subversive about the architectural representations, not only in terms of the manual and sort of clarity and clarity in terms of being able to compare the drawings, but I was struck that um, I could not help thinking of, for those of us of a certain generation or went to certain schools, of Francis D.K. Chain's sort of books, you know, mm -hmm. form, space, mm -hmm. and order, architectural graphics, uh, construction, uh, uh, manual, and it seems to me that the, you know, these materials that we've been alienated from, you know, due to mo modernity or modernism 
are now sort of being drawn in a kind of very familiar way in a, in a kind of sense. So that which had mm. become unfamiliar to us, mm -hmm. right, is now being represented as mm. being mm. familiar and being comfortable and, mm. you know, uh, widely understood and widely sort of disseminated. Mm. Now I have to go check to see how many books you've sold on Amazon, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in five or six different <laughs> languages. So there also seems to be a kind of uh, subversive, propagandistic sort of thing that's going on in terms of the the way that these manuals communicate sort of mm. to others and mm. maybe kind of reintroduces us to uh, to these materials. And I wonder if you can sort of talk about that because I was thinking mm -hmm. about as I saw the goats, like, well, what does this smell like? <laughs> like, yep. you know, what is what does this earth smell like? What is the smells like what is the tent smells like so mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk about that if you could let us in on what what's really going on here with these drawings mm -hmm. yeah um, thanks Mara for the question <laughs> it's a it's a good one and a hard one to answer adequately because I think you're you're hitting on something that we really struggled with right but that architectural modes of drawing are about inducing a level of clarity right in material systems uh, and their articulation and, and kind of construction, right? That they're about this kind of supposed transparency of the medium, right? Which we all know is a kind of, a, a, a kind of illusory condition. Mm -hmm. And so this really interesting question of how do you draw this stuff that kind of eludes that precision, right? That, you know, this, it's messy, it's erosive, it's entropic, right? It, it doesn't kind of behave in the ways that normative architectural, right? materials with their hard edges and defined surfaces um, operate. And I don't, you know, I think that's an ongoing question for us. And I think I'm really interested in, um, you know, how the representational strategies have to evolve in order to kind of engage some of those questions. One way is that um, these projects, the, the, the kind of, we, kind of the drawing of the assembly and constructional systems um, the kind of full life cycle of the project, even though it's kind of drawing off of the more iconographic language of the book, which kind of develops a sort of consistent graphic uh, technique, is trying to engage this idea of the building not as a fixed artifact, but as something that kind of emerges, but also kind of, you know, uh, eventually kind of, you know, decays back into natural cycles. Um, but, you know, this kind of really interesting question came up all the time of like, well, what, what do we, how do we draw the line, right, of the straw bale or of the mm -hmm. kind of hemp wall or of the thatch um, because architectural techniques are not kind of adequate to it, right? They don't, um, they don't have that mechanism. So you're right, there's this, there is a strange way in which the supposed precision of the, these more kind of, um, uh, kind of, at some level, conventional modes of architectural representation, which hopefully we're using in interesting ways, but um, but they they imply a, a, s a kind of cut and dried quality to things um, that isn't doesn't necessarily inhere in the materials themselves, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a kind of an inadequacy of the representational technique on the one hand, um, and then there's maybe the de deployment of a number of different representational strategies beyond the pure kind of section to try to engage with some of those other qualities. And I don't think we're there yet, to be honest. Like I think that it's gonna require more experimentation, more thinking and, and, and more drawing, right, in a way to draw out those aspects of it. Um, and, you know, I think it's a, it's a, a super interesting question uh, for us. And I think you, you're, you're hitting it on the head in many ways, but um, there's a kind of, um, you know, maybe there's that sort of subversion that you're talking about, which just has to do with um, re-representing, as you say, materials that have not been understood in this way in a format that makes them um, more legible and accessible, presents them as kind of, in a way, rationalized. But, but that's also, you know, there's a problematic there, right, that you're also kind of pointing to that I think we also need to kind of move beyond and invent new strategies for. Right. I wonder if there's something that you you decided to remove from a house, you know, like something that was, because as you get to the, and following of Mari's question, in a way, well, as you basically introduce other material culture or mm. uh, into the, the definition of a house, there's moments that things start to be challenging yeah. uh, assumptions or ways of, for instance, there's things that are really stinky, right? And right. Your question about, 
So I wonder if there's something that you decided to remove, you know, something that, oh, this is going too far, you know, or something <laughs> like that. Because that, that, that probably tells uh, uh, what, what is the limits of when, what, what can be tolerated to a certain or by a certain audience or... Yeah, no, so I wish I had a really interesting response to that because <laughs> it's a really interesting question. But, and, and you're absolutely, you know, right, which is, you know, I, I think it, it raises questions about, like, all of the assumptions that we have, right? So, on the one hand, we can say, yeah, there are these problematic conditions that would emerge mm -hmm. in engagement with these materials. But on the other hand, I would say, well, maybe we need to question some of our assumptions about mm -hmm. comfort or what mm -hmm. we consider kind of, you know, repulsive or acceptable uh, in the context of our architectures, mm -hmm. right? And we've all become kind of used to these kind of, um, you know, homogenous, sanitized, right? Always clean, perpetually new um, environments, right? Mm -hmm. But that hasn't always been the case, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if one just sort of takes into consideration the notion of the aging of materials, for example, which of course is inevitable and um, present in all kind of materiality, right? Like, you know, we think these walls are pristine, but we see, right, the patching <laughs> and the water damage, right, and the repainting that kind of imperfectly covers, right, the tape joints and mm -hmm. um, and screw marks, right? So, y you know, it's, it, you know, maybe what I would like maybe to invert the question a little bit is not what would you remove from the house, but how would you have to live differently, right, maybe yeah. to kind of encounter some of these conditions and how might that kind of change the condition of the house itself in a kind of fundamental and potentially kind of productive way. Mm -hmm. right. There's a question there. Hello, uh, my name is Tom Jeed. Um, I really appreciate the lecture. I've been a big fan of your work and LTL as a whole. Uh, my question relates to kind of the transition between your work and the manual section where the poche is almost indifferent to the interstitial of the wall compared to your current work where the, the poche is almost the driving force of the architecture itself and kind of mm -hmm. the, how you reach that process. Yeah, I, well, first of all, I would, I would hope to say that the poche is an indifferent in manual <laughs> section. Yeah, so, it might be too hostile. <laughs> but uh, so, if you look at those drawings, we did pay a lot of attention to kind of the articulation of the different material systems within the walls and componentry and closure systems, envelopes of those projects. But I think they also represent a different. Um, you know, th th those are projects that, by and large, are based on industrialized material right, mm -hmm. conditions, concrete, steel, and glass, um, uh, uh, other kinds of highly processed uh, materialities, right? And so um, by their very nature, they're assemblies of um, uh, kind of elemental components that are kind of aggregated in different ways. Uh, concrete is maybe an exception to that, but it, you know, it, it also, um, you know, in the sense that it's a homogenous, right, arguably kind of monolithic material. Um, but I think part, so part of it's, I think, in the nature of the change in the materials themselves, right? Um, and part of it's a kind of intentionality about, in a way, shifting the focus from, um, although these are all building sections, they're also much more focused on kind of the, quote unquote, the wall section, right? Um, and um, looking at the material assembly of the, uh, the wall itself and the kind of constituent components, but also the fact that in a lot of these instances, um, the thickness of the wall itself was um, uh, uh, kind of um, a, a either a singular material or assemblies of other material systems working together in kind of unexpected ways um, that um, uh, are very different from the way kind of conventional kind of modern industrialized architectures operate by and large, right? Through their, their kind of multiple laminations of different um, membranes and layers which have specific functionalities and, and uses, right? So the, um, although I wouldn't say the manual section that the wall, the poche, quote unquote, was neutral, um, but certainly in the manual of section, we're interested in maybe questioning the notion of poche in as much as poche as it was historically deployed kind of cancels out the materiali materiality of the wall as well as the kind mm -hmm. of labor that goes into the constituency of the wall, Michael Young writes a, about this actually. Um, so, um, so kind of revealing, right, what the, mm -hmm. the, the constituent matter, right, um, the kind of invisible thickness of the wall itself and, and what it's comprised of was, was absolutely the kind of focus of, of, the, of, the, of the most recent publication yeah. for sure, yeah. Maybe one more, the final question, yeah? Oh. Let's do the three uh, together, like yours, yours, and then CRC, and 
and we, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Mark and Andres, for this incredible presentation. Uh, we have been discussing in the studios with Rosanna and Thomas about collections and the significance and major, major meaning when we analyze a network of elements rather than them individually. And this is one of the most interesting aspects of your work, that rather than going deeper in one material or one typology, we are seeing an uh, extended collection of many of them. And I can imagine that behind this compressed um, information on your book, there is many thought behind. And it's also a, almost a curatorial practice of selecting those mm. contents and projects. And I would like to ask about how was this curatorial process, if I can call <laughs> like this? And what were maybe the challenges faced, uh, including that you are um, talking about so many locations, scales, materials, etc., and how, how it changed across, across many of those scales? Yeah. You know, it's great. Maybe we can just oh, like take the three of them and then. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Ah, there's four. Okay, so <laughs> let's take two and two. And you, you also had a question, right? Uh, Marisha. Yeah. Yeah. So Marisha. Hi. Thank you, sir, for the ah, Okay, there's many. Okay. <laughs> many, many, many. I'm uh, Vincent. I'm a student. Um, the construction method you listed and detailed, um, it to me, uh, obviously. Uh, more costly than a conventional one to achieve the same uh, comfort and uh, energy efficiency. And uh, I don't really see how you can, in the future, to uh, ma make it uh, reduce the uh, cost and uh, spread the use, given how much uh, chemical treatment and uh, layers of thing to make them, make them work. Uh, so can you share like um, your plan and how you plan to yeah. promote promote these methods and uh, encourage people to pay to do this? Okay, well, so maybe we can take uh, these two and then the others and we conclude with, yeah. Yeah, and I know this is going on a while, so I'll try to be relatively brief. Well, I mean, I guess we would make the argument that these material systems aren't necessarily more expensive, right? That the the kind of complex layering of chemically comprised uh, ingredients, the kind of building products that I was describing earlier in the lecture, um, actually kind of are cost costly, they contribute to cost there, and as well as, um, you know, having all of the uh, uh, kind of negative environmental and, and health impacts that I described, right? Um, but if you think about a material like straw or earth, right, um, these are inexpensive, yeah. ubiquitous materials, they're, they're everywhere, so you can, um, deploy them relatively easily, right? The soil for a project can come from the soil on the site, doesn't require transportation. You know, Lola um, Benelon talks about this, right? That dirt, it's dirt cheap, right? Um, uh, and so uh, straw is agricultural waste, it's being thrown out. And those jumbo mm -hmm. bales, I've seen them like on the web, you know, they, people sell them for like $11, right? Mm. It's like these are very inexpensive materials, comparatively speaking to more heavily embodied carbon um, material systems. So I think the challenges are less about cost, although there are obviously are, are costs involved in, um, you know, bringing these, these systems into a point where they can actually be deployed uh, in a construction. But, but um, part of the interest in these materials is that they can be, you know, they can be used with kind of minimal processing, right? So the companies that I was describing, like EcoCocon and, and, and Croft are building uh, projects uh, at kind of competitive prices, right? Using these same materials to achieve, um, uh, um, you know, better thermal benefits than an ordinary wall without the kind of toxic and environmental um, impacts, right? So, um, you know, we could, it's a long, longer question and it's, it's a super important one because if we can't make an argument for economic viability, um, then, you know, obviously these things will, um, will, will not um, come to scale. Um, and, and of course, there are impediments and challenges to that for sure. I'm not saying this is easy. There's lots of kind of technical, um, uh, 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 kind of uh, complex technical questions that have to be negotiated. But inherently, these aren't more expensive materials, right? Inherently, these are readily accessible. They're 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 um, they're out there, and they're they're in many cases going to waste, right? Um, the 
second question, or maybe the first question about curation. Um, you know, I think we wanted to get a range of these material conditions in a way to understand the different, um, uh, let's say, the different ways in which they were kind of catalytic to architectural responses uh, in different formats and in different kind of climatic and cultural conditions. So we, we very specifically chose projects from uh, many different geographic regions, from different climate contexts, right, from tropical to kind of northern uh, climates. Uh, of course, there are places in the world, like for example, in northern Europe, the deployment of a lot of these materials is more common. So, um, uh, you know, that probably ended up kind of biasing things in certain ways, but we tried to select from, uh, you know, a kind of a range of, of projects in many different places across multiple continents to, to get that range. The houses were all relatively small, like a, a lot of them were like 1,000 square feet or less. We, we were really trying to work with houses that were economical in their construction and not exorbitant in their usage of, of space. Like one of the, the, the impulses I think is to not only think about building with more intelligent, less destructive materials, but also to build in ways that um, are, are, are kind of more minimal and, and less consumptive in general, right? Um, so how much space do we need, right? We can kind of question that. Um, and then the other um, was to, um, to really look at projects that for us in one way or the other use the encounter with the material as a generator for the uh, kind of spatial, programmatic, um, and tectonic response, right? So it's, you know, it's super useful that um, low carbon and embodied carbon or, or um, uh, carbon sequestering materials can be that there's a kind of ability to replace, let's say, worse systems with better ones. But you can do that with making the same exact building, right? Like architecturally speaking, right? Um, we can replace this insulation with better insulation. We can replace the structure, um, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it doesn't necessarily, in all of those instances, result in a, a shift in the nature of the architecture that results. Mm -hmm. So we were really interested in the, all of these houses that for us, they were houses that catalyze these materials in ways that uh, change the architecture, that you couldn't build these houses out of ordinary materials, that there was a kind of intrinsic relationship between the two. Rosanna has a house uh, in the book, uh, by the way, uh, amazing house um, uh, that draws on the kind of use of bamboo to create this uh, kind of more open environment um, that allows for kind of, uh, kind of climatic engagement of airflow and um, ventilative cooling while creating uh, a, a kind of complex set of spaces out of a simple set of parts, right? Um, so, um, but each one, right, each of these systems requires something different. So responses in terms of mass, bamboo is, is a kind of a linear element that can be clustered and combined and aggregated in different ways. So, uh, you know, all of these different characteristics were interested in to us. Um, and, um, and, and also how they would relate to one another, right? So how they would kind of um, interact in different ways and, and um, how one could take advantage of the individual qualities of each one in combinations, right? Good question there. And, and also Tiersina, yeah, the three. We take the three of them and we yeah. conclude with this. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you. That was marvelous. And uh, coming to what you were just mentioning about the bamboo really caught my eye, the fact that you, let's say, um, mentioned bamboo as a very important uh, construction material, but uh, you didn't mention, and perhaps it could be a suggestion, not only to bundle it up as such, but because it's even stronger than steel in traction. Uh, I don't know if you guys explored into that uh, possibility because it could be something very interesting, a little bit more along the lines of uh, less is more some 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 way. Yeah. Yeah. No. The, the oh right. We're doing more, more than one. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Um, so I first thank you. Really appreciate your work and how accessible you've made everything. It's incredibly formative as a student, and I think the way we practice as I don't know uh, generation. Um, so I think the, the work that you're proposing is a shift in the way we build, and I wonder if it also requires a shift in the way we think about, for example, permanence, stability, wealth, the death of buildings, the death of our own, <laughs> um, change. Mm -hmm. And I feel like maybe this is something that is required to happen in parallel for this changes in the way we build mm -hmm. to be um, meaningfully adapted 
And I wonder if this is maybe some of the struggles that you're finding in, in getting these things built, um, of this like cultural yeah. shift that we need to make. And I wonder what are the ways that you may be addressing this need in the shift we think, um, maybe through your work as an educator, maybe policy even. Um, and I also wonder if you see particular challenges in the U.S. specifically mm -hmm. um, in this, this need for this shift. Maybe Chelsea and we. Um, hi, thank you for sharing all this work. Um, I think my question overall addresses this idea of metrics, um, metrics and how it relates to maybe the values that they are built on. I mean, the selection of certain materials that we're looking at, um, you know, curatorially or in the way that they're drawn or presented has this sort of idea of embodied value or embodied um, inherent value of capturing carbon. And, you know, as you're sort of going through, um, let's say, in, in a way, what world does that live in? You know, is it the present one? Is it one that doesn't yet exist? Is it one that we have already found problematic? Um, especially in this set of metrics and how it relates to worlds as they relate to labor and technology. Because, you know, as we all know, 3D printing in, 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 in yeah. clay is so much different from, you know, making a rammed earth wall or these bamboo laminate sheets are so much different from bundling them with different kinds of people, different kinds of communities. Yeah. So it's this a question about metrics and what are the values and what worlds do they imply and where are we? Or where maybe where where's the project even? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if I can answer all those three questions <laughs> together, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll try to see. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think the question of metrics is, I mean, it's, it, you're, you're asking a very specific question about metrics, which I appreciate. I think the question of metrics in general is a really interesting one and one we um, also struggled with in the production of the book. You know, we did these life cycle assessments for selected projects in the book, um, kind, of, um, uh, kind of cradle to gate um, carbon assessments. Um, and we all know that those are like, it's, it's, it's a thing unto itself, that whole um, a process and it's full of all kinds of complications and pitfalls and complexities. Um, uh, in other words, um, kind of, you know, how you draw the line, where you get the data, how it's evaluated, how it's standardized in one region versus another makes it very difficult to come to any kind of uh, sort of comprehensive blanket way of conducting those kinds of um, analyses, right? To apply a kind of a standard blanket metrics across the grain of all of these different projects. If I'm carrying bamboo from a nearby um, grove to build locally, the value carbon-wise of that bamboo is very different from bamboo that's been shipped, um, you know, 20 miles even or a thousand miles to get to a new location, et cetera, et cetera. Right? We all know. We all know this. Um, but I think you're asking a slightly maybe different question than that, and maybe it relates back to the other question regarding um, the maybe requisite shifts in the kind of broader culture that might allow for, right, or, 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 or might need to accompany some of these changes in the way that we think about architecture and building. And, and I would, I would, I mean, <coughs> that is um, the subject of my current studio is actually asking some of these very same questions, which is if we're thinking about um, biogenic materials, which may not represent the same degree of permanence, um, you know, uh, on the other hand, permanence itself is a kind of, um, uh, uh, kind of, you know, this assumption that's undergirded architecture for many centuries, but in fact, right, has never been the case, right? Our buildings have never been permanent, really. Um, and uh, in fact, everything that we create is subject to, um, to time, to impermanence, to decay, to entropy at, in kind of varying scales. And is it possible to kind of reevaluate uh, those phenomena, not as a kind of a negative condition to be forestalled, but actually as a productive one to be engaged, right? Um, and maybe the, the kind of desire, right, the kind of illusory kind of desire that permanence is possible um, is something we need to kind of question and rethink, right? And it, I think it goes to these questions of what is the world, right, that, um, that uh, maybe these kinds of projects um, suggest. And I think it, it, 
you know, it, it does sort of, I think, lead to, and that's what's interesting to us about these materials, right? It's not just that um, they are, um, you know, in all of these more measurable and demonstrable, quantifiable ways, um, uh, 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 kind of important uh, ways of thinking about building and how we, um, and, and changing the ways we think about building. But the, the more, uh, I think, nuanced ways in which they shift our relationship to the architectural project and how they kind of require us to question certain assumptions, right, about things like uh, durability, maintenance, repair, transformation, change, um, and, you know, how we live in relationship to the things that we make and put into the world, right? Um, and, um, and I don't have an all of I don't have a roadmap for negotiating that, un unfortunately, right? But I think it's a, for, for us and for me, that's a really, that's really exciting, right? And, and, um, and necessary, I think, right? That, um, you know, it isn't necessarily a question of making these products fit into the standardized expectations that we've come to have for the last kind of 100 years uh, and that we apply to industrialized materials, but we have to maybe shift the way we evaluate and value things, right, in a more fundamental way. Um, oh, and there was a question about bamboo. Mm -hmm. I, I will just say kind of quickly about that. One of the really interesting things, I mean, relationship to this question is that when you're building with these kind of bamboo columns, and there are many people obviously know much more about this than I do, um, but, um, you know, it, it does raise really inter interesting questions about, for example, the predictability of structural um, uh, mm -hmm. conditions, right? So. Um, as architects working in this country, right, we're subject to all of these sort of um, uh, kind of sort of legislated boundaries, right, that we have to be able to kind of um, uh, work in predictable ways with materials that behave, right, according to certain patterns. And when we're working with something like a bamboo calm, which is an inherently variable natural element, um, there's, right, a certain uh, kind of notion of standardization that no longer applies, right? And the predictability of that element in combination with other elements, right, and its tensile capacities, for example, um, are, um, uh, you know, escape in a certain way the, the kind of calculable nature of, of kind of structural engineering logics, right? That, and, and that's one of the in, uh, challenges, right? Mm -hmm. How do we kind of incorporate some of these practices that uh, maybe don't fit into the accepted patterns. We can do it by by actually working towards standardization, right? So that's happening already in the processing of bamboo into other structural elements. In, es in essence, that's what we do with trees, right? Um, but maybe it also uh, allows us to work in other ways. A lot of the people that work with bamboo in various parts of the world are working really kind of through empirical experimentation, through yeah. large-scale modeling, through kind of on-site testing yeah. uh, to arrive at their kind of structural forms and whatnot. So. Fantastic, Mark. Thanks so much. <laughs> really good. Really good.